Thank you. This is my third year in a row at ScholarConf. <laughs> After three years here, it kind of feels like home. And I have to say, it's good to be home. Today, I'm not presenting alone. I am presenting with a contributor who has helped me for nearly a year on a variety of projects ranging from Zeo type inference to Zeo Q to Zeo environment and whatever the heck it is we're gonna be talking about today. I'm very pleased to have helped her reach this high level of skill and functional programming so quickly. So without further ado, please help me welcome to the stage, Wiem Zine Labadee. Thank you. Thanks for the organizers for this opportunity. I had a dream to co-present with John Dugos. Thank you, John, for making this happen. I'm your number one fan. <laughs> Thank you, EM. Modern applications are asynchronous and concurrent. They're asynchronous so they don't waste threads, and they're concurrent so they can use every last CPU core to reduce application latency. But building an application that uses all the cores and doesn't have any race conditions or deadlocks is really, really freaking hard. And today, Yem and I are excited to share with you some of our open source work aimed at making that problem simpler. To start, we are going to wake up the computer. <laughs> I hope. Ah, there we go. And we're going to talk about a bank heist. That's right a bank heist right here in Warsaw. And then we're gonna see if we can find a hero who can stop the mastermind behind this heist. And then what we'll do is we'll do a little recap at the end, and we'll try to learn something about what we talk about so that when all of us disband from this conference and we go back home into our place of work, each one of us can become a concurrency hero at solving the tough challenges we face at work every day. Ready? Let's start. Part one, the bank heist. So in the land of delicious potatoes, good cheap vodka, and way, way, way too many Scala software engineers, there's something in the water here, there was a bank, a large, successful bank with branches all over the country. And this bank had a lot of money in its vaults. So much money, in fact, that it attracted the attention of a thief. And not just any thief, mind you, but a thief so legendary, he, or she, was known only by the hacker alias number one. Now, some thieves like to pick locks, and others like to use brute force to break into a place, but not number one. Number one is a hacker extraordinaire. And number one used his or her skills to crack into the banking system's software. And deep inside there, number one discovered this critical function that transfers money from one account to another. This function starts off by making a check to make sure that the from account has enough money in there, which is a sensible thing to do. It makes the transfer, and if there was not enough money in the from account, it just suspends until there is enough money in the from account to ensure the transaction will at some point go through as long as someone puts enough money in the from account. Now, our thief, being the concurrency wizard that he, or she is, knows about a class of exploits called the double spend exploit. In a double, ex, dub, double spend exploit, what happens is you take the same amount of money, and if you're able to find some consistency bug, you can end up spending that money twice, basically creating money out of thin air. So in this first exploit that our crafty thief takes advantage of is called the race condition exploit. And in this exploit, the thief executes a number of concurrent transfers. And what happens is, at some point, two threads 
will be checking that condition at the same time. And then they'll both go to transfer all the money out of the from account. So they'll both transfer all the money out of the from account at the same time, ending up creating money out of thin air. It's a double spend exploit. As a result, our crafty thief walks away with millions in the bank. In the next exploit, our thief takes advantage of the fact that this balance variable here is not declared as volatile. And that's a problem because modern CPUs have dozens of cores. And they all share the same main memory, but it's actually very expensive to read data from main memory. So what happens is threads take little bits of data from main memory and they cache it in the local cache that every single core has. The problem with this is different cores end up with different copies of the data that they cache. To take advantage of this, our crafty thief uses the stale cache exploit in which they've got one thread that's debiting money from the from account and another thread that's checking the balance, but the balance that is checking is different than the balance that was debited over here on the left-hand side. As a result, double spend exploit. Our thief walks away with millions more in the bank. The last exploit that we'll look at today involves taking advantage of the fact that instructions that may look atomic in your Scala program are actually not atomic. So this one here, from.balance minus equals amount, it looks like it's atomic, but it actually compiles down to lots of different JVM bytecode instructions. And in particular, notice how far away the get is removed away from the put. That's quite some distance and possibility for other things to be happening concurrently. So in this exploit, our crafty thief does the non-atomic instruction exploit, doing a bunch of transfers at the same time until they get one thread that is debiting the balance account at the same time a different thread is debiting the balance account. And then what's going to happen is these instructions are going to interleave and one of them is going to end up clobbering one right of the balance is going to clobber the other one. And as a result, less money will be debited from the from account than actually should be debited, thus creating money out of thin air. Our thief walks away again with millions of dollars in his or her account. This is a problem. This is a major problem. We've got to find a way to stop this thief. And it's a concurrency bug, actually a series of concurrency bugs, and fortunately, we M and I happen to work on an open source library that makes asynchronous and concurrent programming easy. It's called Zio. Maybe there's something in Zio that we can use to stop this thief. No, 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 not Zio. Let's try Lux to solve this problem. Not Zio? Okay. Well, I'm not optimistic, but we'll give Lux a try. Let's see what we got. To solve this problem using Lux, we create a lock for the account, and we make sure that you can't modify the balance of an account without having that lock. We also are very careful to change the balance to make sure it's volatile, to ensure that it won't be cached in every core, but that every access will go to main memory. And then to implement the transfer function, we simply acquire a lock on the from account and acquire a lock on the to account and then we perform the transaction. Problem solved, right? The problem is our thief knows another exploit called the deadlock exploit. Locks cannot be acquired at the same time. They have to be acquired sequentially. So to take advantage of the deadlock exploit, our thief initiates two transfers with the same accounts but flipped orders. So what happens is thread one acquires the from locked, Thread two acquires the two lock, and then they wait on each other's locks forever and ever. The system's deadlocked. The banking software grinds to a halt, and where you can deadlock banking software, you can find plenty of ways to make money. Sorry, we, um, but unfortunately, locks proved no match for our crafty thief. Sorry. Maybe. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you sound sorry. Maybe <laughs> now it's time to reach for something no. in Zio. No, no, no. I'm pretty sure that actors will solve this problem. Actors? <laughs> yeah. 
You do know the title of this talk is Atomically Delete Your Actors, right? Late Ben probably paid her to say that. All right, fine. Let's see if we can use actors to solve this problem. To solve this problem using actors, we just create an actor for every account. And the actor manages the state, the balance of the account, so we can ensure that the account can't lose money. It can be consistent with respect to its balance. The only way to interact with the actor is through messages. So it solves some problems. And then we implement the transfer function by sending a withdraw message to the from actor. And if that succeeds, we send a de deposit message to the to actor for the same amount. Now, the really interesting thing about this solution is that it solves the problems. It's not subject to race conditions or deadlocks. Have actors won? <laughs> Have actors done it? Well, here's the problem with actors. Even though it solves this very simple toy example, it does so because actors provide transactionality with respect to the state of a single actor. That transactionality does not compose across many actors. So if you want to make coordinated state changes to a bunch of actors at the same time in a consistent atomic way, Actors can't solve that problem. A simple example can demonstrate. So let's say we, M and I, go out to a cafe for lunch, and we decide in advance that whoever has more money in their bank account is going to end up picking up the bill. So the first thing we do is we send a balance message to my account. We found it, find out I have $99 in my account. And then we send a balance message to EM's account, and we find out that she has six million dollars? EM, how did you get six million dollars in your account? <laughs> All right, and then we do the check, and clearly EM has way, way, way more money in her account than my account. But then let's say at the same time, a prior charge goes through on her account. Earlier in the day, you went on a mad shopping spree, and you bought roughly $6 million worth of clothes and stuff, and you, you had yourself a grand old time. And then that goes through right before we perform the transfer. So now, WeM's account is debited for a $70 meal, and she's left with negative $60 in her account. And she's not happy, and of course, I'm not happy, because, well, I should have paid for that lunch. On the other hand, you did just buy $6 million worth of stuff, so maybe I don't feel so sorry for you. So unfortunately, actors are unable to stop our thief, and it's because the transactionality that actors has does not compose across actors. They lack composable transactionality. So if actors don't solve the problem, and what are we going to do? I think now I know Zio will solve this problem. Finally, you're willing <laughs> to give Zio a try. OK, let's do it. So today, we, M and I, are excited to announce that Zio is getting software transactional memory. So software transactional memory provides elegant solution to this problem that composes to handle even the most complex concurrency challenge. With SDM, we declare each of the accounts to be a transactional reference that holds the account information. Then atomically, in a single atomic block, we're going to perform a bunch of different operations. We're going to retrieve the balance of the from account, we're going to ensure that the balance is greater than or equal to the amount. Then we're going to debit the from account, and we will credit the to account. And finally, because it's all in that atomic block, it gets committed at the end of that block. This solution has no deadlocks, no race conditions, no stale cash exploits. It's 100% bulletproof. And not only can it handle the simple toy example of the transfer, but it can also handle the example of lunch, we and I going out to lunch, and any other example you, you can imagine.
because the transactionality guarantees that it provides scale across more than one transactional reference. They scale to as many as you want. It is declarative composable concurrency. The hero of this story and every other concurrency challenge that we face at work is Zio STM. Software transactional memory gives us the ability to atomically perform a bunch of reads and writes on transactional memory. STM is similar to database transactions. We start with an initial state, we perform a bunch of operations. If the transaction fails, we roll back and complete this transaction with failure. If the transaction is not ready yet, because some conditions are not satisfied, STM can wait and retry later once when the transactional memory changes. On the other hand, if STM detects that the memory has been concurrently modified by another th uh, thread, STM will automatically roll back and retries the whole transaction to ensure consistency. And finally, if the transaction succeeds, STM will commit this transaction with success. Zio STM has two type, uh, two uh, simple data types, STM and TREF. STM describes a transaction that can read and write transactional references, and every transaction can fail, retry, or succeed. STM has two type parameters. Every transaction will either fail with an error of type E or succeed with A. Transactional reference is a reference to a value. TRFs can, read, can be read, uh, read and written inside STM transactions. It has a single type parameter which describes the content of the transactional reference, which, which is a mutable value. The incredible power of STM is its deep composability. You can use one transaction inside another transaction, and you can use that transaction inside another transaction, which itself inside another transaction, and so on, forever and ever. Let's cover the API of TREF. As we see here, every method we return STM transaction. This provides composability. And in order to create a TREF with an initial value, you can call make. Using get, we retrieve the value inside TREF. Using set, we can set a new value to our TREF. And if we want to update the value using the old value of TREF, we can call update. And modify will update the value, and it can perform a computation using the old value. To commit a transaction, you can call atomically on the companion object of STM, or you can call commit on every transaction uh, STM. Using succeed, we can create a successful transaction with a specified value. And using map and flat map, we can transform and chain transactions together, and thanks to flat map and map, we can build our transaction using for comprehension. 
Using fail, we can create a failed transaction with a specified error. And as I mentioned earlier, that a failed transaction we rolls back and undone the transaction. So here in this example, if the sender has an insufficient uh, funds, the balance wouldn't uh, the balance of the sender wouldn't be updated. Otherwise, if uh, it has enough money, the sender balance will be updated. In order to recover from errors, we can call fault. And here, in the failure case, we return false. In successful case, we return true. And using fault M, we can recover from errors using, transactional, uh, using transactions. And in this case, we return, uh, in both cases, uh, failure and succeed, successful case, we return the amount uh, of the balance of the sender. Using a retry, we can tell STM to autom uh, automatically retry the transaction whenever the TREF will change. Which means here, for example, the transaction will be suspended if there is no ticket available in TREF. Otherwise, the transaction will be succeed. Using ZIP, we can combine two transactions. Using check, we can, we can suspend, uh, uh, suspend the transaction if, uh, until a condition sati uh, will be satisfied. In this example, we check if there is an available ticket that is less or equals to the, pr the given price. If the condition is not satisfied, this, transac this transaction will be suspended until org TRF will be changed and it will retry and it will check again and again until the transaction will be succeed, successful and then we will return the most, the cheapest ticket. And is, this is the same example using filter, but using filter we can uh, we can retrieve the value of our transaction and check in one step. Using or else, we can compose two alternative transactions. In this example, we want to beat the cheapest possible ticket. If the left hand side fails or retries, the right transaction will be performed. And if the left transaction will be succeed, so the uh, STM will choose the, uh, the, le the left transaction. Using collect, we can perform map and filter in one step. And in this example, we check, we check in a single person by taking the first passenger from the queue and if there is no passenger, collect will be suspended until a passenger's TRF will be modified and uh, one, at least one passenger will be available to update this uh, and uh, check in the passenger. So as we see in those examples, STM is extremely composable and the code is easy to reason about. ZEO STM lets us solve complex concurrency problems with simple and beautiful code. So it's easy for me to sit up here and say that concurrency is really hard and STM is really great. But I want to show you that. And not only that, but teach you actually how to use STM to solve some of the really hard concurrency problems out there. 
So that's what we're going to do real quickly in the next section. I'm going to look at some very classic concurrency data structures that you have probably already used. How many people out there have used um, a queue in either Cat's Effect or Zeo or Monix or FS2 or something like that? How about a promise? How about a semaphore? Okay, so a fair number of people. These are classic concurrency data structures that are out there in all the functional effect systems. So whether it's Monix or FS2 or, or Zeo or, or whatever you're looking at, these are the bread and butter of building concurrent applications. We're gonna look at step by step how you personally could implement these concurrent data structures using STM. The first data structure is a semaphore. And a semaphore holds a certain number of permits. And different threads can come and acquire permits and then do something and then release them. It's a generalization of a lock. Now, if a thread tries to acquire more permits than the semaphore has at that point in time, then it has to wait until other threads release their permits. So it allows you to ration access to some resource. The average functional semaphore out there took around seven really smart contributors who are experts in concurrency, 11 plus months, and involves 300 and one lines of painstakingly developed code. That's a lot. These are very complex things that it's very challenging to try to attempt this unless you have the required background. Let's see how you could implement a semaphore using STM. First, you could model a semaphore as a TREF that contains a number of permits, the number of permits that are in the semaphore right now. Then making a semaphore becomes as easy as making a TREF and sticking in the initial capacity as the value of that TREF. Acquiring permits from the semaphore involves retrieving the number of permits inside the semaphore, making sure, doing that check, to make sure that there's enough permits for whatever the user is trying to acquire, and then debiting that number from the number of permits in the semaphore and then committing. Finally, releasing the permits in the semaphore involves updating that TREF and adding the number of permits back into it. This semaphore here is 100% concurrent safe. It is 100% asynchronous, so it never blocks threads. It's safe in the presence of interruptions and exceptions. It has no time or space leaks just like the other ones out there. The other ones out there are like that, but it was really, really hard to get in that way. So using ZOSTM, you could create a semaphore like this in about 10 minutes, using eight lines of very simple, type-safe, declarative code that reflect your intention, not the low-level mechanics of what's going on underneath the scenes. A promise is another classic concurrent data structure. And what you can think of a promise as is an asynchronous variable that you can set exactly once. And when it's unset, a bunch of threads can wait on its value. And then as soon as someone sets it, those threads continue with whatever that value was. So this is called deferred in Cat's Effect. It's called promise in Zeo. It's called promise in Scala's standard library. These things are everywhere out there. They're a basic building block of concurrent systems. The average functional promise out there took, again, around seven contributors almost a year and almost 300 lines of code to get correct. This has to be interruption safe, error safe, has to have no time space, no, no, uh, th no time or space leaks, and it has to be safe from any race conditions and deadlocks. Let's see what you could do using ZOSTM. First off, you could recognize that a promise is basically just an option of A stored in TREF, so you can model it that way. Then to make a promise, you just make a TREF and stick none inside it. Now, to complete a promise with a given value, you get the option out of the TREF, and if it's sum, you succeed with false, because the promise has already been completed, but if it's none, then you set the promise to be sum of that value, and you succeed with true. And finally, you commit that atomically. To await on the value of the promise, 
what you do is you just call get on that T ref and you collect it looking for the case where there's a sum of A so you can extract the A. And like we have said, remember, if that collect doesn't match, this, retransac this transaction will try again until it's modified and it will keep on doing that until there actually is a sum inside there. And then you commit the whole thing. This promise implementation has no time or space leaks. It's interruption and error safe, no deadlocks, no race conditions, and it would take you 10 minutes to build this. This is something you could do in 10 minutes with eight lines of code. Finally, our last example, we're going to take a look at the most complex kind of asynchronous queue there is, which is a doubly back-pressured asynchronous queue. So like all these STM data structures, they never block. They're 100% asynchronous. They never waste threads. And this one is going to be the same. A doubly back-pressured queue has the following properties. If the queue is totally empty, then if you call take on it, you have to wait. You'll be suspended until some, someone puts something in the queue for you to take. And on the, on the flip side, if the queue is totally full and you call offer to put something in the queue, well, you're going to have to wait too. You'll, you'll actually be suspended until there's room in the queue for you to put your stuff in. These are very complex. To build one of these that has no time or space leaks, no race locks, no deadlocks, and is safe in the presence of errors and interruption is astoundingly hard thing to do. In fact, it, it takes a whole bunch of contributors, a lot of months, and basically 500 or more lines of code to build what I just showed you on the preceding slide. How would you do that using ZOSTM? Well, first, you could model a queue as a case class that contains the capacity of the queue, and then a tref that contains an immutable Scala queue. Now, this is the immutable queue that's baked into Scala's standard library. To make a queue, you simply create an empty Scala queue, and you stick that into the case class with a specified capacity. Then to implement offer, you retrieve the immutable Scala queue from out of the tref. You check, this is how simple this is, you check to see that there's enough room inside the queue. And remember, if this check doesn't succeed, the whole thing ends up being retried until it does. So once the next line of code is executed, you know there's room in the queue. This happens asynchronously. And then finally, you update the tref by enqueuing the new element, and you commit the transaction. To implement take, it's only a little more complex. You retrieve the immutable Scala queue, you dequeue that, and if you get a head and a tail, then you update the tref to be the tail, and you succeed with the head. And otherwise, you simply retry. And finally, you commit the whole transaction. So this big, complex, data structure that would take a concurrency expert 500 lines of code to get right, you can do in 14 minutes with 13 lines of code. I'm not exaggerating when I say that software transactional memory, which originated in the Haskell community and is their preferred means of solving every single concurrent problem out there, is one of the most beautiful and powerful abstractions in all of functional programming because it's useful, and we can actually use it to solve the problems. And the difference between this and a lock-based solution or actor-based solution or whatever else out there is just night and day. STM can give you superpowers. As we have seen today, neither locks nor actors provide a satisfying solution for concurrency problems using mutable states. Software transactional memory lets us, lets us solve complex concurrency problems using very simple and beautiful code. If you enjoyed our presentation and you want to become a hero, get started today using Zio. If you have any questions, you can join the Gitter uh, channel, Scalaz Zio, and Take a look, uh, check out on uh, Scala ZZO on GitHub repository. I have a question, Liam. Yeah? How did you end up with $6 million in your bank account? <laughs> You've got some explaining to do. 
All right, so this code will land within the next couple of hours, so look for it on GitHub. I hope you've enjoyed seeing a functional take on solving concurrency problems, and I hope that we have given you motivation to atomically delete all those actors from your code base. Un unless you're doing distributed stuff, and, and then, okay, keep them in there for now. You, you can delete them in next year's ScholarConf presentation. <laughs> Thank you all for coming to our talk. You've uh, been wonderful, and both of us look forward to seeing you again next year at ScholarConf 2020. Thank you. <laughs>